Olaf Baum was born in January 1927 in Stockholm, Sweden. Olaf was an intelligent young boy and he soon learned German and English. In 1945, he joined the army and served for a couple of years. He also visited a lot of other countries. It was during these visits that he started to form strong political opinions. Olaf identified as a socialist democrat. Olaf became prime minister of Sweden in 1982. He made a lot of enemies because he was very outspoken and his views were far on a left. On 28 February 1986, he and his wife Lisbeth Baum was walking home from the cinema in Stockholm. Olaf was then shot in the back from close range. A second shot grazed Lisbeth's back. Medics were quick on the scene to take him to Sabbatsburg Hospital, but it was too late. Lisbeth survived the ordeal, but Olaf did not. The street was busy, so one would think someone saw who did it, but it was not the case. No real suspect came forward after talking to the witnesses. During the next few years, there were a few possible suspects that the police looked into, but none of them could be connected to the case. In 1989, a man named Christer Peterson was convicted for the crime after Lisbeth Palm identified him as the man who took the life of her husband in a police lineup. An appeals court later overturned the conviction and they had to let him free again. Then on June 10, 2020, Swedish prosecutors stated publicly that they knew who ended the life of Olaf Baum. They named him as Stig Engström, also known as Scandia Man. Engström was one of about 20 people who had claimed to witness Olaf getting shot. He worked as a graphic designer for Scandia Insurance Company, located near the crime scene. In the initial investigation, Engström told investigators that he actually tried to resuscitate Olaf. During the most recent investigation, it was found that he lied however. It does not necessarily mean anything, but it was noted that Engström had very different political views than Olaf. He was later identified as a possible suspect by Swedish writers Lars Larsson and Thomas Peterson. Engström took his own life back in 2000, so it is not really known why Swedish prosecutors now feel so confident it was him. Nevertheless, they have closed the case and consider it to be solved. It took 34 years, 10,000 interviews and 134 confessions before this case was solved. A lot of people are not happy about a conclusion that the Swedish prosecutors made. They do not believe there is enough evidence to be certain Engström is guilty. The investigators made a lot of mistakes during the investigation and the fact that it took 34 years for them to solve such a highly publicized case might have influenced their decision. In a lot of cases where the media and the public presses the investigators to solve a case, mistakes are made. With Engstrom not being alive anymore, we might never truly know what happened. As for now, the case is being seen as solved however. Susan Eads was a 20-year-old woman from Texas. She aspired to be a model. At the time, in 1983, she worked as a waitress. Susan worked at a prickly pear bar and also worked part-time for a place called Charlie's Bar. In August 1983, she cut off work early and went to a place called Jason's Club, where she was last seen. At one point during the evening, an unknown man asked her to dance, but she declined. The last time she was seen was when she left the club. The next day, her body was found in an empty lot on NASA Road 1 in Seabrook, Texas. The police determined that she was choked by the bodysuit she wore the previous evening. Her 1976 Chevrolet Monte Carlo was found in a parking lot of the Gulf State Yachts Boat Store very near to where her body was found. Her Clear Lake High School class ring she was seen wearing the previous evening and a gold necklace 
was nowhere to be seen. The police started their investigation by taking DNA samples they found on her jumpsuit. They also talked to people that saw her at Jason's club. The people told police about the unknown man who had asked Susan to dance with him. Seabrook police created this composite sketch of the mysterious man. They were not sure if this man was involved, but they did not really have other leads to follow up on. Then out of nowhere, a strange man started calling Susan's mother. Most of the times, he would just call and not say anything. Later on, he did start to speak. She got police to record the calls. The man claimed that he had pictures of Susan. He even offered to show them to her mother. He claimed his name was Bill and he lived in Houston on Telephone Road. This man always hung up before police could trace the call. He also never followed through with his plans to show the photos. A language expert were used to see if he could find anything of interest. The language expert could determine that his accent is southern, but that did not really narrow it down at all. It is not known if this man was actually involved or if he was just someone had read about the case in a local newspaper. After this, the police had nothing else to go on, and the case soon went cold. In 2017, investigators looked into the case once more. They came across a man by the name of Anthony Shore. He lived in the area where Susan was found back in 1983. In 2017, when investigators took a closer look he was in prison. Anthony had a long list of victims whose lives he took in a similar fashion to how Susan lost her life. Using the DNA samples they retrieved back in 1983, Anthony was ruled out however. Investigators were not able to match the DNA to anyone on their database. It did give the investigators an idea though. They decided to contact the FBI and genealogist. The next few months were spent comparing the DNA sample to online ancestry profiles. Finally, a match came back to a distant relative of the suspect. The relative was a young child at the time of the crime. The relative was very helpful, and after some more testing, the investigators believed they had their man, Arthur Ray Davis. He was the 35-year-old Vietnam veteran and local boat captain. Davis matched the composite sketch almost perfectly. Both had a cowboy hat, hair that falls over the ears, a mustache that hangs past the sides of the lips, high cheekbones and a pronounced chin. They could not speak of Davis though, since he passed away in a car crash. Interestingly enough, the car crash happened just four months after he took Susan's life, and it happened less than a mile from where she was found. Just solving this case is not enough for investigators. They want to know why Davis did what he did. They are asking anyone with information to come forward and contact them. Texas Ranger Brandon Bess said that somebody out there knows him. Somebody out there knows who he was and what he was about, especially at that time in August of 1983. The family of Susan Eats and the investigators gathered to place roses on her grave after the case was recently solved. The family accepts that the case is solved, even though there was no trial or conviction. They are happy they know who did it. Of course, they would also want to know why he did what he did.